sequence of events that have occurred throughout the world, not only here in Australia, that have actually culminated in the development of a vaccine is just quite remarkable. The whole story of enterovirus is just quite remarkable. The Redlands outbreak really focused our attention, particularly with the, the human cases and, and the unfortunate death. And then another death the year later made it really um, honed people's attention into the fact that this is a zoonosis. Uh, it's, it's flying around in our bats. It's occasionally getting into our horses. And when it gets into the horses, there's a risk for people. Our primary interest was really using Hendra virus as a tool to understand how paramyxoviruses in general infect cells. And it's a complex process and involves multiple proteins. And the interesting thing is it involves receptors on cells and humans and horses and bats and all these other hosts that are susceptible to Hendra virus infection, they all have receptors that are really similar. And that's one of the reasons why the virus can infect so many different animal species. Most of the time, the virus level in the bat population is low, okay? So that's not sufficient for the bats to shed enough virus, uh, which will trigger what we call a spillover events or cross species jumping to horses. From time to time in the bat population, the virus level goes up. What we call is a spike. So when we have this virus spike, the hand of virus level goes up and then that triggers this uh, transmission to horses and to humans. We've always found it interesting that viruses like Hendra, viruses like Nipah, these viruses all appear to be naturally existing in bats in, in, in nature. And one of the really interesting things that catches everyone's attention is the fact that when bats are infected by these agents, which cause really severe disease in, in humans and animals, bats don't get sick. So what we're doing is try to understand the bat from its genome to its immunology and how they can interact with the virus. So we can hopefully do something preemptive. So combined with the vaccine, I hope that we're elim eliminate, let's say, 99% of the incidents. We know lots of things about bats, but the thing we know most about bats is we don't know enough about bats. And so in the absence of knowledge in other areas, you go to the area that you have good knowledge in, right? And you, you, so and I think it really makes the vaccine much more important. One of the first things we did actually was make the very protein um, that is the basis for the Hendra virus vaccine today. And we made that uh, about 13 years ago, actually, yeah. Since the advent of um, vaccine uh, against Hendra, there's really been a, a, a major advance. If you protect the horse against the disease, you're also indirectly protecting people that deal with, with that horse from the disease. We knew that the vaccine worked in many different animals prior to even uh, vaccinating horses and doing those experiments. From the public point of view, um, they don't know about a lot of that information and, then they, and they really don't know how to find that kind of information. Um, so all you can do is explain in the best way you can to those questions um, how much we really do know about the vaccine and how we got to the point of actually using it in horses. Well, in the coming months, um, we will have uh, data on um, the safety of the vaccine in pregnant animals. We'll have some very strong fig figures on um, the adverse event rate associated with vaccination. Currently, that's running at a very low level. One day, uh, all horses will be just, as a matter of course, uh, when they're young, just undergo a normal vaccination protocol with, against other diseases, including...